Still going strong? Just making sure you're crashing, right? Good. Then it's my job to see how quickly I can put you to sleep. So, uh, no, it's not my job to see that. So remember, remember, we're only in here for a little bit, and then we're going to move on to an activity. So I want you to be engaged for the time that we're in here, okay? So do me that favor. Do yourself that favor. And uh, don't allow yourself to get too comfortable. I do want to let you know this uh, as we get going on this particular lesson. I mentioned to you Freed Hardeman earlier, but I want to make sure to mention it again. There are some inquiry cards that are over there. These cards, if you fill those out, uh, basically what they do is they tell Freed Hardeman that you're at least interested in considering Freed Hardeman as an option for your education moving forward. It doesn't mean you commit to anything. It doesn't mean that you know, you get, have to pay money or anything along those lines. But basically what it says is, you know, maybe I would like to consider Christian education uh, when it comes to my college choices, and maybe I want Freed Hardeman to be a part of that discussion. So I want to encourage, especially juniors and seniors, sophomores, you can fill these out too, to fill one of these cards out. You'll be able to give them to Miss Aaron over there or give them to myself. And then we've got T-shirts. I saw that you got one. Very good. So if you want a free t-shirt and you're a junior or senior especially, fill one of these out. Uh, if you're younger and you want something for free, you can fill one out to the best of your ability. But there are stickers over there and things along those lines. So I want to encourage you to look at that. Freed Hardeman University only has about 2,300 students. Um, you have a very small teacher to student ratio, which means you're going to get more individualized attention from those teachers. Uh, we have social clubs, uh, so we do have co-ed social clubs. That's where you're going to uh, be able to wear the Greek attire. You know, you think about the cool clubs, and you're going to have devotional service projects, mission groups. That's where your friends are going to, you know, most of them, not all of them, uh, but they're going to be within that group. Uh, you can go into major in nursing. You can major in education, business. Of course, I recruit for the Bible College, and so I would love to talk to you about that. But make sure you look at that because you're going to want those free uh, T-shirts, number one, because everybody wants a free T-shirt. Number two, I don't want to take them home with me. Um, and also, I think you're going to like the fact that Freed Hardeman's an option for you. So I do have good news for you as well. There's an airplane that goes from Memphis to Orlando. I don't know if there's an airplane that goes from Memphis to Lakeland. I do know our hotel is right at the airport here in Lakeland. Uh, but I do know you can be home. You can be at Freed Hardeman in the morning and be home by dinner. Uh, so kind of think about that as you think about maybe going away. Uh, sometimes what, that's what we get. The further away we get from Tennessee, people say, I don't want to go that far. And I understand that. It's hard to, it's hard to transition when you're talking about. I, when I went to college, I, my parents were in Pennsylvania, and I went to school in Texas. And so I understand what it is to go pretty far away, only getting to come home every now and then. Uh, good news is, though, airplanes, they can get you here pretty quickly. So just contemplate that. If nothing else, fill one out for the free shirt. And then also, uh, if you fill those out and I get to take them home, then Freed Hardeman's going to say, oh, Joe, you did your job. You get to keep your job for one more week. So if you like me, if you want me to be able to feed my children, then go fill that card out. If you don't and you want to see them starve, then just don't, don't fill one out, okay? No, do what? Go steal apples and bring them back. That's right. Hey, you paid attention. Good job. Good job. All right, now obviously I don't want you to lose out on this table too, but I'm not going to take that time. Uh, I want you to come over here and check it out. So, All right, let's do this. We're going to pick up with a lesson that deals somewhat with what we talked about in the first lesson. Now, you may look at that and you say, Joe, why not just go ahead and do two separate concepts? Well, it's because you'll notice the lessons today, absolute truth, moral relativism, and worldview. A lot of those are hitting at the same concept. So look at it this way. The more we touch on these issues, the different angles maybe that we add to the puzzle, you're going to be better equipped to, uh, to take the message and to go do something with it. If nothing else, that it'll ground you deeper in God's Word. So when you and I look at the concept of moral relativism, I'm not real sure that's not what it's supposed to say. Interesting. Let me read this to you uh, because that's not it at all, okay? I messed up, not you, me. So here's the deal. We're going to go back and do that right there. You can just look at that one for a second. That'll blow your mind, okay? How about that one? So here's the deal about moral relativism. I want to read this one to you. It's about kind of a definition. If you've ever wondered, well, what is moral relativism? I'll read you the definition, and then kind of, we'll kind of explore it a little bit. But here it is from a book entitled Moral Relativism Explained. It says this, According to moral relativism, there is not a single true 
morality. There are a variety of possible moralities or moral frames or re- of reference. And whether something is right or wrong, good or bad, just or unjust, is a relative matter. It's relative to one or another morality or moral frame or reference. Now, what does that mean? That means this, basically. You can have a truth that's right for you, but just because you have a truth that's right for you, it doesn't mean it's a truth that's right for everybody. Now, I want you to hear me say this because I don't want to leave any of you confused. I am not saying that this is right. I am saying this is what moral relativism is. So you may stand up. Here's the illustration. You may stand up and you would say, abortion is wrong. Or you would say, homosexuality is wrong. And somebody else would look at you and they would say, well, for you it's wrong, but that doesn't mean it's wrong for everybody. I mean, it would be wrong for you to do those things or to get involved. You you might even say this, well, lying is wrong, Uh, drinking is wrong. You you line up any of those issues, right? And what you're going to find is somebody else who's over here and they're going to say, well, that may be wrong for you, but you cannot impose that on everybody else. And what's quite interesting is that we didn't get to this position overnight. I, you've heard me say multiple times that each generation uh, has inherited what the previous generation brought to the table and then built upon that. So when you think about where did we get here in America where you can have two different beliefs that are correct um, at the same time, uh, it really is a concept of moving from, from the pre-modern period to the modern period to the post-modern period. And then beyond that, and of course the best way I can illustrate what pre-modern, modern, modern, and post-modern is, imagine you're in a car and that God is in that car with you. Well, the pre-modern period believed that God was behind the driver's wheel, behind the, the wheel, and that you were in the back seat. Now, it wasn't that they believed in the, the God that you believe in, but there was a belief in that time period of a belief of a super being or of deity that had more to do with the outcome of, the, of life. And it may have been that it was the Judeo-Christian God. It may have been it was Christianity, you know, because this period goes for quite some time. It could have been back in the Old Testament where the Jews, you know, understood who Yahweh was to the much that he revealed. But it could also have been the gods of the Assyrians or the gods of the Canaanites. Um, it, it, there were multiple gods, Molech, uh, Dagon, Uh, There were multiple gods mentioned in the Old Testament. And the idea behind this wasn't that they necessarily all agreed on the God. It was that there was a belief that God or a God was supreme to mankind. And therefore they functioned that way. Uh, you, You read about ancient civilizations who used to sacrifice their children to the God. That was because the God had to be appeased. The God had to be taken care of. Uh, The Egyptians uh, had a god of the Nile River. They would have had a god of fertility. They would have had a god of the crops. Uh, That's the pre-modern period. Modern modern period came along, and some people might argue that that was around the time of of the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, They might say it stretches back that far, but it extends up until about the late 1950s, early 1960s. But in the modern period, the concept was man, in the illustration driving the car, it wasn't that a God is behind the steering wheel and a man is in the back seat. Now during the modern period, the God is still behind the steering wheel, but man has moved from the back seat up to the passenger seat in the front of the car, right? So the the belief of God still driving the wheel was there, but there was this concept, and as we invented things, we... We start, you know, the age of enlightenment was the opening of man's knowledge, the opening of their creativity, that the medical advancements that would occur, the scientific advancements that would occur. You think about all the things that occurred from roughly the age of enlightenment to the late 1950s, early 1960s. I mean, you're talking talking about outer space, studying the stars to going to visit the moon. I mean, there's a big change that takes place. You're talking about people dying of small things, yet now we come up with the discovery of penicillin. Uh, I mean, a lot of big things occurred in that time period, but there was still an overall belief of God was still behind the steering wheel. Well, in about the late 1950s, early 1960s, there was a change of thinking that did occur, and that transitioned us, threw us into what is called the postmodern period. Postmodern period was 
where God was no longer behind the steering wheel, man had moved from the passenger seat to the steering wheel and had taken over the steering wheel as to what is right and what is wrong. So you see kind of that progression over time. And that happened as every generation of humanity that would come along. So when you talk about where we are today, where there could be multiple truths, your, your truth may be true for you. I'm not denying your truth. I'm just telling you it's relative to you and to your situation. And even within that framework, you have individuals who would say, well, in this case, it would not be right to lie, but in that case, maybe it would be right to lie, right? So here's how that would work. If I were to ask you, is it okay to lie? Is, is, is that an okay thing to do? What would you say? You would say no, right? You would say, no, it is not good to lie. So how about this one right here? You go home um, and you, you knock on the door uh, because the front door's locked and you don't have a key to your house and your mom answers the door, but she leaves the door cracked, right? And you ask, mom, is everything okay? And mom says, oh yeah, honey, everything's fine. Why don't you go, why don't you go next door, you know, whoever next door, John. John next door, he was wanting you to go, go visit him. Why don't you go next door? And you go, okay, mom, are you, are you sure everything's okay? And, and mom says, yeah, honey, everything's okay. And she, you say, okay, I'll, I'll go see what John needs and then I'll come back. And she says, okay, honey, I love you. And she shuts the door. And then the guy that was standing behind the door that had a gun pointed to her head who had told her, you get rid of anybody who's knocking at that door. Let me ask you a question. Did your mom do something that was wrong? You say yes. Okay, you're saying yes, and then you're like backing off of it, saying, well, maybe she made that guy mad. What if he was just a robber in the house, and he has a gun pointed to her head, and she said, he, he said, you get rid of that person at the door. I don't care how you had to do it. And so in her way of showing you that she didn't want you to be involved in the situation, she made up a story about John next door. Why do you think she told you about John next door? Because she wanted you to be safe. How did she do that? Did she tell you the truth that everything was okay in the house? Or did she lie? So you told me lying is wrong. I ask you, did your mother do something that was wrong? That's where moral relativism gets a little rough, right? It's always easy to say lying is wrong. And then to say as Christians, we'll never fall into moral relativism. Until you start going down the line of saying, wait a second, let me put some case studies behind this. Let me put a few, uh, you know, hard things behind that. Now, look, I could go to an easier one, right? Let's, let's not talk about anybody dying, right? Let's say this, you boys, you fast forward. Maybe you've heard your dad say this. Maybe you ladies, you fast forward. And uh, you put on this dress, ladies, and you go up to your future husband. And maybe you've heard your mom do this. Maybe you've heard your grandma do this. She goes up to her husband and goes, does this dress make me look fat? Let me tell you what not to say, boys. Sure does. I wouldn't wear that. Don't say that. Ladies, don't ask him that, okay? Don't ask him that. So I do, and it is what it is, and I mean it, baby. If I'm ever asked, of course, Aaron gets to hear me say this regularly, right? I always say, what do, what do I say, baby? That dress, you're not going to say it. I say, that dress makes you look so good. Or know what I say is this, you make that dress look so good is what I say to her, right? So you come up with a crafty answer. Because ultimately it's like, does that dress make me look fat? No, no, you're, you're fat anyway. Sorry, the dress didn't change anything, you know? I mean, really? Is that what you're going to say? No, you're not going to say that. So here's why I throw that out, right? Because the gun pointed to the mother's head, that's a heavy illustration, but when you throw it down to another category, it's like, okay, I can handle that one a little bit better. But at the end of the day, the issues are still the same. If morality is a set standard, then the truth of the matter is this. Is lying against the Word of God? Somebody tell me. Does it violate a teaching found within the Word of God? Okay. Then here's how you determine if something is morally acceptable or not morally acceptable according to the will of God. There is something called, well, how deep can I get with this? 
If it violates the will of God outright, it's wrong. How about that? That makes that real easy, right? The other way is this. That's called a priori, right? You're not going to need to walk away and know that stuff. But then there's something called post priori. That means this. The action in and of itself may not have been morally wrong. But does the outcome of the action lead to it being morally wrong? Now that's getting really deep. If you remember that, you're good. Here's what I want you to understand about moral relativism and some of its downfall. We didn't get here overnight. And if the action violates the word of God, no matter what the outcome is, it's wrong. If the action doesn't violate the word of God, but the outcome of it does, then it's wrong. But that's not what moral relativism is going to teach you. Moral relativism is going to teach you, you know what? Morality can be changed. You know, it, it kind of goes and, and, and comes with time. In the 1950s, this was something that was wrong, but today it's not wrong. So number one, moral relativism tells you that morality can change. Moral relativism also tells you that morality is subjective. I can't get there because I don't know what I did. I'll have to figure that out. It's subjective. In other words, it's based upon what you think and feel. There's no standard for everybody. And morality is individual. It may be true for you, but not for me. Now, I'm going to throw something out to you. I'm believing that you all are able to handle some stuff. And besides that, I have mesmerized you with this image of is it moving or not moving, right? So you don't know if it's a video or not a video as it sits right there. But I'm just kind of playing with your head. So listen to me, okay? Have you ever heard of critical race theory? Have y'all ever heard of that? You haven't, you, you, all you got to do is kind of take your head out of the sand for just about three seconds, and that's a catch word over the last two or three years in America, right? Critical race theory is a part, a small piece of the pie of what is called critical theory. Critical theory is the big pie. Critical race theory is like you getting just a little bit sliver of the pie, right? Because there's other things involved with critical theory. There's like uh, critical colonial theory or colonizing theory. The idea of, especially with the Queen of England, her death recently, there are some individuals who are celebrating and memorializing her life. And then there are other individuals who are talking about um, she, the one who oversaw the, the uh, overtaking and spreading the British colonies and overthrowing people and how bad it was, right? And so what they're doing is they're drawing off of this concept that to be a colonial concept is a bad concept, right? Well, that fits in line with what's called critical colonial or colonizing theory. The one I particularly like about critical theory is called critical fat theory. I really like this one. Critical fat theory says this, it is your fault that I'm fat. I love that concept. And the reason it's your fault that I'm fat, here's why, is because your position in life has allowed you to live in such a place where you can afford to go shopping at nice restaurants and to nice grocery stores. And because you can go shopping at nice grocery stores, you can afford to buy organic food or food with lower preservatives. Therefore, because of where I come from, I cannot shop at those grocery stores. Therefore, I have to eat the bad stuff. In other words, it's this. It's your fault that I'm fat because when I go to McDonald's, because I can afford McDonald's. It is your fault that I eat a Big Mac, large fry, and get a Diet Dr. Pepper or Diet Coke. It's your fault that I do that. Now, you may look at that and you'd say, Joe, no, it's not. Nobody had that. Why didn't you order a grilled chicken sandwich? Why did you order a Big Mac? Okay, you're telling me you don't have enough money to go shop at these real ritzy uh, places, but why not just go and get a salad at McDonald's? I mean, you could have ordered a salad. Why didn't you get a salad? You don't understand. Don't ask that question. Because what you're trying to do is impose your beliefs on me. And the only reason you're imposing those beliefs on me is because your background and where you're coming from. So therefore, don't impose those beliefs on me. You say, Joe, why are you bringing up critical theory within this? Well, because critical race theory, crit critical fat theory, critical colonial theory, there's others out there. There's one, please, I'm going I'm to say this word. It is what it is. It's, it's a scientific, but it's critical queer theory. That would be the idea of the homosexuality concept, right? So all of that falls within a growth of moral relativism in a context of postmodernism. That means this. There may be a truth that's true for you, but it's not true for me. And if you ever try to impose your truth on me, 
the only reason you're trying to impose your truth on me is because you're coming from your position of power is the nice way to say it. What's the catchphrase in America? Privilege. So therefore, you can't impose your... So here's the deal. What I'm offering to you is this. Postmodernism is and moral relativism has worked its way into our society in ways that we don't even understand the fullness of it. And we don't have individuals who are waving a flag going, wait a minute, that's moral relativism. That's relativism. I'm hearing the words. I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. Because we don't have a culture anymore that's been trained to recognize if what we're talking about is moral relativism or an objective truth. That's why when you and I really start going down this line, I show you something like this, is because it's interesting the way that differences can occur. I want you to raise your hand if you see that that image is moving. Look at the image and does it look like it's moving to you? All right, lower your hand. Raise your hand if the image doesn't look like it's moving, if it's stagnant. All right, interesting because we're almost 50-50, probably a little over half, don't believe it's moving at all. And some of you have seen that. i got to tell you right now, that is not a video. That is a standstill picture image. Now, the reason I show you that is because I want you to understand the power of the brain and the power of thought and the power of perception. Because in some of your minds, you're going, it's moving. And in others of your minds, you're going, it's not moving. And if you were to argue that, you'd be like, no, just look at it. It's moving. I'm telling you, it's moving. And I come back to you and I'm saying this. That image is an image that I put into my slideshow. It's not a video. It's not rolling. It's not looping. It is a standstill image. And you're looking at it going, no, it's not, Joe. That image is moving. See, the objective truth of this is it's not moving. Your perception is it is moving. Therefore, here's where you struggle. Do I go with the objective truth or do I go with the subjective perception? You see, when you and I get into moral relativism, I want to introduce you to some of these concepts real quick. You're not going to have to walk away knowing all this, but the laws of thought that we introduced uh, in the first class they really are significant in understanding how to deal with issues of morality. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you can establish some principles without ever using the Bible. Now, I'm not an advocate of developing moral principles without using the Bible. You'll see that. I believe the Bible is the standard, is the truth, is the light of my path that I need to follow. My own thoughts and my feelings are not the light of my path that I need to follow. The Word of God is the truth, right? Uh, that's what we need to understand. However, there are some basic laws of thought that we can look at to say, wait a second, that doesn't pass. Kind of like the roadrunner tactic. We need to understand some basic laws of thought. Thought number one is this. It's called the law of identity. And it states that if any statement is true, then it's true. And you look at that and go, are you, is this what they teach in college? And I would say, yes, it is. If, it may be what they teach in debate. And it's typically what they teach in logic. Is anybody here taking logic in high school? Uh, yeah, I know our kids have taken logic, right? And one of them's still taking it more than... You're still in it, right, Camden? I thought so. Rules of logic, rules of thought are interesting. Because you would think, we don't need a law for if something's true, then it's true. And I would offer to you, yes, you do. Because if something is true, then it means it's already passed the test to be proven true. And therefore, that is a basis that you start weighing everything else against. Right? So let me ask you this. What, describe a square to me. Somebody describe a square. Go ahead. What's a square? Four corners and what? And flat? What else? What would you say? Four corners and the sides are all even, okay? Let's do that. Four corners and the sides are all even. Is that, a, is that true? Somebody either say yes or no. Your sugars are tanking, so help me out. It is true. So if I came to you and I said, I'm going to show you a round square. Would anybody have a problem with that? Why would you have a problem with that? No, I feel it is a thing. So if I feel it is a thing, a round square... How are you going to tell me that I'm wrong? Somebody tell me. Yes. Do what? 
draw that. Okay, and what if I just drew a circle? Now, what if I respond, and I love this, y'all are doing great. What if I responded, the only reason you think that's a circle instead of a round square is because you got to define what a square was. I didn't get to define a square. That's, a, that's your definition of square. Do what? I'm hurting your brain. <laughs> nice, nice. But you understand what I'm saying, right? Now, you would look at that and you would say, what do you mean I defined what a square is? It's a square. It's an established truth. We know what a square is. If somebody came up to you and said, nope, I'm going to draw a circle, but I'm going to call it a round square. You would look back at them and you would say, you are not using facts. You are using feelings. You are using perception. You are just identifying as whatever you want to identify it as. Have y'all heard that before? Yeah, you see, the same concept is going on in our culture today. Where if you were to walk up and you were to say this, you're born a man, you have XY chromosomes, you have testosterone, that's what you are. Somebody else says, nope, I'm a round square. And you say, nope, you're not. You have XY chromosome, you have testosterone, you're a man. And here's the way it would work, right? Instead of a round square, they'd walk up and say, nope. I'm a woman. And you look at him and go, uh, you're not using facts. You're not even using logic. So why would we need to even state something like this? It's because if you cannot establish common laws of thought, then the reality is they're not using thought to come to conclusions. Moral relativism, where it says your truth may be true for you, but not true for other people, I'm telling you, is not based upon reality. Number two, Law of non-contradiction. Law of non-contradiction says this. It says that no statement can be both true and false at the same time. So where somebody comes up to you and says, that's true for you, but that's not true for me. Well, then it's not true for me either. It's just my opinion, right? Because if it's true, the law of identity says it's true. But it can't be because the law of non-contradiction says the statement both can't be true and false at the same time and at the same place about the same item, right? So this building exists. This building does not exist. Those statements cannot both be true at the same time. It is logically impossible. Either the building exists or it doesn't exist, but it cannot both exist and not exist at the same time. Number three, laws of thought. It's called laws of excluded middle. The law of excluded middle asserts this, that any statement is either true or false. You look at that and go, this is crazy, Joe. These are so simple. And I would offer to you, the laws of thought weren't created just today in this generation. Laws of thoughts have a great history to them. That goes back quite some time. So why would we even need to think about it? It asserts that a statement is either true or false. It's because individuals who make claims about the same item that are in opposition to one another, not only do they violate the law of excluded middle, they violate the law of non-contradiction. It cannot both be and not be at the same time. And statements cannot be in opposition and both be true. So this whole concept of, well, that's true for you, but not for me, is not rooted in logical thought. If it is true for me, but not for you, then it is not true if your statement is correct. But if the law of identity has been established, whatever is true is true. So a, a, a square has four corners that are 90 degree angles and all sides are the same. And somebody comes up and draws you a circle and says, that's a round square. Well, the law of identity has got to be established. If the law of identity is established, then the law of non-contradiction and the law of excluded middles comes into play. It can't both be a square and a circle around time, at the same time and both be accurate. You look at that and you say, Joe, why is that significant? It's significant because we live in a world that this picture really does exemplify. And that means this. You say, what's exemplify? This is a picture that has been used multiple times to explain, for those of you who are adults, those of you who are older, what is called existentialism. Existentialism is a belief that whatever your experience has shown you, whatever your perception is, that is your reality. So the individual who comes in, they all are blind, right? That's why they have glasses and sticks, not because they're the you know, sunglass stick crew. They're all blind, right? And they walk in, and the guy who picks up the trunk, he doesn't know this is an elephant, 
But he says, in the room we have a big water hose. Existentialism says this, then that's what we have. This room has a big water hose, that's what it is. Somebody else comes in and they feel the sharp tusk and they say, we have sharp, uh, sharp items, I don't know, it feels maybe like a spear. And they would say, that's exactly what this item is then, it's a spear. Somebody else would feel the leg, we have a tree trunk. Somebody else would feel the belly, hey, we have a big barrel. Somebody else feels the tail, hey, we have a rope, right? All these people come to various conclusions about what that elephant is. And at the end of the day, nobody's standing up and saying, no, we have an elephant in the room. They're just simply saying this, and this is what existentialism says. Existentialism says whatever you felt it was is what it was. Now let me ask you a serious question, young people. Describe a culture that exists with this belief. Do you think it's chaotic or is it orderly? It would be chaotic, wouldn't it? Why would it be chaotic? Somebody tell me. You don't have to be the only one. You two have been the brave ones of the whole I don't know why Bus is still sleeping. No, I'm teasing. You're not sleeping. I see your eyes. Why would that culture be chaotic for everybody just to come to their own conclusions and to say, hey, this is a rope? Nobody knows right. Nobody knows wrong, right? What would you say? Yeah, so if all those guys went into the same room, and how many arguments do you think that they would have? They were like, hey, did you, did you feel that water hose? Water hose? It was a tree trunk. Tree trunk? It was a rope. Y'all don't know what you're talking about. I can't believe we were all in the same room. Same room. What were you going to say? That is so wise. He said, if everybody thought it was their own thing, there would be a lot of fights and arguments. Let me ask you all a question. Are you all getting tired of the fights and arguments going on in America right now? Isn't it interesting that a culture that is steeped in moral relativism actually gives more problems than a culture that understands truth is objective? It doesn't mean cultures that have objective truth don't have problems. But you're seeing and experiencing in a real way the struggles of a nation that believe that this picture is an accurate rendition of what is supposed to happen when it comes to truth. Now that's why I tell you, and you've heard me use these words before, and I don't know if you got into them in your discussion classes or not, but objective truth versus subjective truth. And I've, I've told you the object of truth is the building exists. If the building exists, it doesn't matter what I think or I feel. The building either exists or it doesn't exist. But the subjective is two people going into the same movie, both coming out. One says it was the greatest movie I've ever seen. The other saying it wasn't the greatest movie I've ever seen. And at the end of the day, if you always talk about it in subjectivity, subjective is based upon you. That's the core of when morals are based upon you, then it leads to chaos and destruction and hurt. Now, here's where I've got to be honest with you. There have been individuals who would claim that their morals and their values were rooted in the Word of God, and they would hurt people. That doesn't mean that they were living what they were claiming. Because that's one of the biggest beefs today in America when it comes to religion. Well, back at the Crusades, they were hurting people under the name of Jesus Christ. And you're looking at that going, yeah, you know, just because they rode under a banner, you really have to stop and ask yourself, were they living according to the king of that banner? And look, I'm not going to paint the Crusades all in one picture. What I'm trying to tell you is this. There is a belief that if at any point in time you can... You can link a religious belief to bad behavior, then you have permission to throw out the entire religious belief. I'm offering to you, be cautious in doing that. Allow for the merits of that belief system to stand on their own two feet to be established. If they can't be established, then they're not right. If the merits of Christianity cannot stand on their own two feet, the Bible stand up to criticism then everything we're talking about here is not, not accurate. Do you understand that? We're just talking about living as a good citizen. But we're not talking that way. We're talking about a belief in a concept that literally can change everything.
I have some quotes here from some of these individuals that are called the founding fathers of America. This is John Adams. John Adams said this, It's religion and morality alone which can establish the principles on which freedom can surely stand. Securely stand. You take away religion, you take away morality, you take away freedoms. The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. Now look, I'm not going to pretend that these individuals were all great people and that they applied freedom across the board because they didn't. But it doesn't mean that their basis isn't true. It means they weren't applying it across the board, right? So what about this one? We have no government armed with power, capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. In other words, morals and religion, they serve hand in hand to help humans uh, live and function together collectively in a positive. And John Adams would say, there's no government armed that can deal with a culture that throws out morality and throws out religion as a basis of their true standard. He would say, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So in other words, you think about the foundation of our country. Our foundation of our country, the, the constitution, according to our founding fathers, was written based upon concepts that morality and religion would be fundamental to our society. He's not the only one. This is an individual, George Washington, who would say this, and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. What he's saying is this, let's pretend that morality can be maintained without religion. Now, religion doesn't mean we went to church. Not to these guys. To these guys, it means that this was a foundation of belief in God, a practice of more of of piety, that means I wanted to be what God wanted me to be and give Him the awe and reverence He deserves, um, that that was the basis of morality. George Washington would also say this, whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education, minds of peculiar structure, reason, and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. Now look, these aren't my ideas these are their ideas, and whether you like these guys or not, I don't know. But it's important for you to understand the basis of the foundation of the country of which you live in and operate in as you're studying culture and you're studying moral changes. Because it really shouldn't surprise us then that as we see a change across the board regarding uh, behaviors and beliefs in God and belief that I can don't need to be attached in any way, shape, or form to religious observances, thus the religious nuns of last night. It shouldn't surprise us that we start to see changes. I pulled up an article here from safehome.org from 2022. This is January 19, 2022. So it tells you the most recent that I could go. Here's, here's what I thought was interesting. In 2020 alone, this is the year 2020, what's true in one state isn't true in another. And because crime is hypercritical or a hyperlocal problem, it's important to consider the community level data when attempting to understand crime in America. In 2020 alone, there were over 3.9 million incidences reported to the FBI by local law enforcement agencies. To understand how crime has changed in America, we analyzed the past decade's worth of crime data from the FBI to determine which types of crime are rising or falling. Now, they looked in about 3,000 cities with a population of 10,000 or more people each. Here's what they discovered. On average, violent crime has climbed 12% in these studies of United States cities. While property crime has decrease, decreased by 33% since 2010. Robbery rates fell in America by 23%, while murder, rape, and aggravated assault all climbed by 25% or more. Motor vehicle theft was the only type of property crime to rise in America uh, in these particular cities. It increased by 48%. Do you know what that means, young people? Motor vehicle theft? People stealing cars. Carjackings. Okay. Out of America's largest metropolis, Detroit led the nation in both murder and rape. Seattle had the most reported burglaries, and Memphis, Tennessee had the most lars larceny theft incidences. Out of all the cities with smaller populations, those between 100,000 and 250,000 people, two Louisiana cities had the highest murder rates, Baton Rouge and Shreveport. And it goes through all the crimes and what's gone on. So here's what's interesting. Overall violent crime in America... Overall, violent crime in America from 2010 until 2020, that's what this study shows, has increased by 12%. Murder and manslaughter increased 26%. Rape increased 38%. Robbery decreased 23%. Aggravated assault 
increased 29%. Now, I only go there with these because I want you to understand. If moral relativism is worth studying, and it is, and it should be concerning, it is, then one of the ways we drive that home is to say this. Cultures that are steeped in you believe what you want to believe and I'll believe what I want to believe and you do your thing and I'll do my thing, what happens is we actually see a moral decline in those countries, America being one of those. But it shouldn't surprise us. 1 Kings chapter 21, go ahead and open your Bibles there, turn in your Bibles there. 1 Kings chapter 21, this is the account of Ahab and Naboth's vineyard. You remember that? Ahab and Naboth's vineyard. Naboth was an individual that had received a vineyard from his father as an inheritance. Ahab was a king, and Ahab wanted to come in, and he wanted that vineyard. As a matter of fact, you look at verse 1 of, of, of 1 Kings chapter 21. The Bible reads this way. Now it came about after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is close beside my house. And I will give you a better vineyard than it in its place, if you like. I will give you the price of it in money. Verse 3, But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. In other words, this wasn't just land. This was inherited uh, from generations after generations. Verse 4, So Ahab came to, into his house, sullen and vexed, because the word of, the, of which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. If you ever want to know if a baby fit is ever recorded in Scripture, this is a baby fit. You ever seen somebody throw a baby fit because they didn't get their way? They walk into their room and they just lay on their bed and start crying and then they turn their back to the door all because he didn't get what he wanted. Well, his wife comes into the room, verse 5, but Jezebel's wife came into him and said to him, How is it that you, your spirit, is so sullen, and that you are not eating food? So he said, Because I spoke to Naboth. I don't know if he said it that way, but I envision he did. Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite said, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel's wife said to him, Do you now reign over Israel? Arise, eat bread, and let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Somebody tell me what happened to Naboth. What happens? Anybody know? If you can sim, you know, signal with your hands, what happened? <laughs> That's right, he was killed. Jezebel had him killed and was, he, he was, they falsely accused him so that there were men who drug him out and stoned him. They threw rocks at him. There was no marijuana involved with that. They stoned him with rocks, right? And so the idea was this. She was called out. And what happened was in verse 20, And Ahab said to Elijah, uh, Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, why would that even be considered? It's because the king wanted it. It was true in his mind that he's the king, he should get it. Jezebel, his wife, came in and thought he were the king, you should have it. But Naboth didn't have any obligation to give it to him or to sell it to him. But they thought that he should. And so what happens was, in a world that is steeped and in a logic that is steeped in relativity, if you want it, go get it. And I will tell you this, there are a lot of people who exist that way in our society today. I'll show you this as we come to a conclusion. Judges chapter 21 verse 25 was one of those scriptures that you had to look up and text. You didn't know that this was going to be in this lesson. But this particular text is quite interesting in dealing with the judges. Because it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But I want you to know something, that that's not the only time, nor the first time, that this danger came about. I want to show you three other times in the book of Judges, before it ever comes up in Judges chapter 21, where that was said. Verse, uh, chapter 17 and verse 6, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 18, verse 1, In those days there was no king in of Israel. Judges chapter 19 and verse 1. Now it came about in those days when there was no king in Israel. And of course, in each of those chapters, I don't have time to flush them all out, chapter 18 and 19, there is bad behavior associated with when there was no king, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What I want you to understand about moral relativism is this it leads to chaos. 
it leads to destruction. It leads to people not getting what they believe that they, they want. Because ultimately at the end of the day, that changes, right? That's what the belief of moral, moral relativism is. Morality can change. And for those who believe in moral relativism, it doesn't stand strong. So I end this way. What is our goal then? Not to be more relativist, but to be individuals who stand true on God's Word. Psalm 86, 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. That was the prayer of the psalmist. And I pray that's your prayer today. That you would not live according to whatever looks right in your own eyes, but you would live according to what looks right in God's eyes. So thank you. So the lesson that you're going to take from this is this. Is there such a thing as a round square? Okay, then that's because we know what a square is, right? So in all those concepts, just think about this. Anything that you come across that people say is morally right or is right and wrong, you've got to weigh it against the, the truth. And if it doesn't measure up to the truth, then you don't have to go along with it, even if it hurts people's feelings. You stand with the truth. Let's pray, and then we'll pass it over. Dearly Father, thank you for blessing us with a great day. And Lord, we know that as the day continues on, that it will be tempting, Lord, to... To have that sugar crash, maybe to get too comfortable, we pray that you give us the energy, the attention uh, to continue strong, to be engaged. And Lord, that's when we have to put forth that effort. Thank you for these young people. And I pray you bless them now as they go to their classes. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to... Uh...